If you've watched the previous two videos I did on Jack 1 and Jack 2, my love and admiration of this series is pretty obvious. Since I'm someone who loves Jack 1 and Jack 2, you might expect my thoughts on Jack 3 to be more of the same, since it seems you either love the whole series or just certain parts of it. However, Jack 3 is not the same to me. Despite having played Jack 3 several times in the near 20 years since its release back in 2004, my playthroughs of it as an adult have only made me look at this one as more of a disappointment compared to the first two. Now let me make myself clear. I don't hate Jack 3, I don't think it sucks or anything, it's just that I thought Jacks 1 and 2 came together in a really satisfying way. Different ways between the two of them, but satisfying in both cases to where I enjoy replaying both of those games whenever I feel a revisit is in order. Jack 3 is one I'll replay because, well, I just replayed 1 and 2, might as well play 3. Then I walk away thinking, yeah, it's alright I guess, but it's a total mess when looking at it as a package. And that is, again, coming from someone who thought Jacks 1 and 2 were both excellent games in their own right. There isn't even that much history to go over in regards to the development of Jack 3, or at least in ways that are relevant to the discussion at hand. The history behind Jack 1 and 2 got me interested in exploring it because of how those stories of the evolving gaming culture impacted this series harder than any other, something so obvious because it changed so much from its first entry to its second. So I spent a long time in those videos exploring why Jack 1 was so well crafted only to be met with a less enthusiastic audience response than other games at the time, leading to Jack 2 being the way it was. For Jack 3, they knew they were sticking with the story, characters, and gameplay structure of Jack 2 and wanted to add on to the existing moveset for Jack to make it feel like a full sequel and also improve upon the elements they got criticism from after releasing Jack 2. And that's what they did. Shipped the game just one year after Jack 2, compared to the two years of concentrated development that both Jack 1 and Jack 2 had gotten. Suffice it to say, I think this video will thankfully be much shorter than my video on Jack 2 last week, just focusing on Jack 3 as a whole what I think it gets right, where I think it misses the mark, and giving my theory as to why that is. So let's not waste any more time and get into Jack 3. The story begins in the desert as Jack has been banished to the wasteland for life, as Daxter and Pecker protest. This is an outrage! I am outraged beyond words! Although I do have something to say. I always got a chuckle out of that. Daxter and Pecker decide to join Jack in his exile from Haven City as the game cuts between their march through the desert and flashbacks that show how we got to this point. Despite killing Kor at the end of Jack 2, some of the Metalheads survived and are continuing their assault on the city, but the new Freedom League, led by Jack and company, have to fight on two fronts as the Metalheads have taken over one side of the city, but on the other, Crimson Guard Deathbots are being mass-produced. So they're fighting a losing battle. Jack's name is being dragged through the mud as he's accused of being an accessory to letting the Metalheads into the city, which technically is true as Jack's missions for crew throughout Jack 2 while a means to an end to help the Underground get intel, were also the things that ultimately allowed Crew to get the Metalheads into the city to wreak havoc. So, by a vote from the Grand Council, led by a guy named Count Viger, Jack is banished. But he's found by a group of Wastelanders living in a sanctuary city called Spargus, ruled by Damus, Pecker being his new advisor, while Jack and Daxter have to prove themselves to the people of Spargus through combat and various desert expeditions, setting up the first act of Jack 3, where all the problems begin. The pacing in Jack 3 is really messy. You start the game off in a tutorial with basic platforming and combat, but then you have to ride a leaper lizard to catch six rats, play a mini game where you have to press the buttons that correspond with the ones in the screen, do tutorials on how to drive, race in the car, collect artifacts with that car, do a leaper lizard race with the local monks, battle desert metalheads in a vehicle, battle in the arena again, more content with leaper lizards, and then after an hour of gameplay, the player finally gets access to a mission with raw, unfiltered Jack and Daxter platforming which was the thing you came to play. When in Jack 2, the first mission, yeah, it was a tutorial, but it felt like it was part of the experience as you escaped captivity. Then, your first several missions are all core gameplay. The first mission in Jack 2 that I'd argue had nothing to do with core gameplay was when Jack and Daxter were first sent to the drill platform to destroy the Metalhead Eggs, which didn't come up until an hour and 45 minutes into your playthrough. Even then, that mission still had combat and platforming. Like I said, the platforming action that I think defines J&D isn't playable until an hour into the game. Now, you could say that driving and such are the core gameplay mechanics of Jack 3, but in that case, I just think it's a downgrade from Jack's 1 and 2. While they did have mini games and driving, they were verifiably side portions of the game. Jack 3 blurs the line much more. Driving missions don't bother me, but then when it's back to back with leaper lizards and such, yeah, the first act of the game is really boring. Once you actually get into the main platforming content of Jack 3, I think it's enjoyable, but then after two good levels, you then do more of this stuff, like searching for survivors in the desert, driving this one large vehicle through a nearby metalhead nest, and the worst of all, shooting down targets with a turret. The first act just sets the stage poorly for Jack 3 because you're met with a host of minigames that obscure the focus of the game. 
And that's not to say it's all terrible. Like I said, I think the driving missions, as soon as you get access to a ride with guns, that is, are fun. The Metalhead Hunt mission has these cool camera angles for when you get hit where the car goes flying. It's cool to see how in-depth the physics are for these desert vehicles because this is back when developers talked about designing elements like that from scratch. Um, it really gives us an opportunity to showcase the rigid body physics system that we developed. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very complicated uh, simulation of physics. We have different gear ratios, different slip differentials, centers of gravity, um, horsepowers and torques, so it really is a, a, a realistic simulation um, on this dune buggy. I always enjoyed using the Dune Hopper vehicle, which can jump really high into the air. Combined with the boost turbos you get, and you'll see some serious height and distance. I think all these vehicles are appealing from a design perspective, too. I never really thought about this before playing Jack 3 for this video, but I'm pretty sure this game is the first time we ever see a vehicle move on wheels in the Jack series. We saw the Lurkers use balloons in Jack 1, while the Zoomer the player used could hover a bit and had a propeller in front of it. But Jack 2 was much more futuristic with its flying cars and racing pods. It goes to show that the Wastelanders are making do with scraps, having less futuristic technology than Jack 1 while still being cool nonetheless. It's all pretty neat, but again, in the first hour of the game you only play as Jack to fight in the arena twice, otherwise it's a sea of things that were considered side content in the last two games. First impressions do matter, and one of the reasons why I don't go back to Jack 3 often is because I just remember the fact that the game's first two hours have a lot of side content tossed onto your lap when the first act should be the time to get me excited to keep playing more of the game. I do get that most of these are mechanics the player will use later in the game, so it's better to have a soft introduction earlier in the game before the big test. But I just think it could have been spaced out better because the first two hours really felt bogged down by all the minigames and tutorialization. It also isn't great because the story wants the return to Haven City to feel grand, after having spent a lot of time getting to know the people of Spargus City in the desert, the main thing the game was advertised around. However, by the time you begin the quest to re-enter the city, two hours into the game, I haven't done much in the way of fun gameplay, so my attitude is, instead of thinking, I have new friends now, I'm just like, yeah, take me back. You don't feel like you've been here long at all because I'm still getting into the game by the time you return to Haven City. But at least things get a lot better once you do. Starting with this long mission in the mines to get back into the city, a boss fight against a fully functioning precursor robot, not like the modded one from Jack 1's final boss. And then once you get topside, the content gets a lot more interesting. Making this as good a time as any to mention the fact that there are plenty of things I really like about Jack 3. Those things being both major and minor. So let's look at them. In terms of quality of life features, I appreciate the fact that menus all scroll much faster in Jack 3 than they did in Jack 2. This just improves the pace of the game if you plan on changing a setting or visiting the secrets menu from gameplay. Graphically, Jack 3 is working off the same standard as Jack 2. Widescreen, progressive scan, no load screen, cutscene models, all the stuff you've come to expect from the Jack series is here and accounted for in Jack 3. Although, the game still suffers from the same performance issues that affected Jack 2 with screen tearing and frame drops. The latter of which might actually be worse in Jack 3 because of how much more action's on the screen. But I won't give the game too much crap because for PS2 standards, Jack 3 is loaded with content. I mean, you have two massive hub worlds, the sprawling wastelands and the ruins of Haven City. You don't see all of the city like you did in Jack 2, but most of it is here. Pulling off all that with the dev time this game had while keeping the bar of the visuals as high as they did is a feat in and of itself. Now, when talking about the actual gameplay, Jack 3 improves upon elements from Jack 2 in numerous ways, first of which being the streamlined travel. The fact that players would spend a long time in Jack 2 just going from place to place is one of the biggest criticisms Naughty Dog took to heart when designing Jack 3. So instead, the game places missions very close to one another so you don't have to spend several minutes going from place to place. For example, when in the port in the second act, all the missions are right here in this area, or they're in Haven Forest, which is like 90 seconds away from the port base. In addition to that, Jack 2 also had you complete a mission, but then drive back to the quest giver so you can get another one. This still happens a few times in Jack 3, but a lot of the time you'll finish a mission and then a character will get on the communicator and say the next mission is this, go do it. Like how Samos will tell you to go to Haven Forest for a mission, and then when that is done, Torn will say, Jinx is waiting for you outside for the next mission. This keeps the pace of the game going and contributes to why Jack 3 is shorter than Jack 2 by about an hour. I had imagined designing the game like this also saved Naughty Dog time on the amount of cutscenes I have to animate, since half the missions in the game don't have a cutscene that triggers them, you just go do them. Jack 3 adds things that are quality additions. The jet board was great in Jack 2, giving you a satisfying bit of extra speed with some visual flair thrown on top. It's pretty much exactly the same in Jack 3, but you'd want to use it more in this game because of the fact that now you get this charged jump and a ground-based attack so you don't fear whipping it out in the middle of a platforming combat mission. 
Dark Jack was almost useless in Jack 2 because of the fact he had to drain the full bar of Dark Eco in order to tap into Dark Jack. It just made Dark Jack something you wouldn't want to use unless the situation seriously demanded it like you were low on health in an enemy rush or a boss fight where your other weapons still do the job just fine. Jack 3 is a 100% improvement in this aspect because the transformation now works more like the Devil Trigger in Devil May Cry. The circular part of the gauge must be filled before you can be Dark Jack, but once you've transformed, you can transform back in an instant with the press of a button. So since the stakes don't have to be as high for you to use Dark Jack, his old moves like the bomb or the electricity spin are more useful. And I also got use out of the new moves like where you toss beams across the screen. To balance out Dark Jack, this game also allows you to tap into Light Eco to become Light Jack, the Yang to Dark Jack's Yin. Dark Jack allows you to tear through enemies with vicious attacks, and so Light Jack is built around defense and mobility as you learn various moves throughout the game, like the Light Jack Shield, the Time Stop, the Self Heal, and these Light Wings you use to reach places you couldn't otherwise. I actually don't use Light Jack much throughout my playthrough of this game, and that's not because there's anything wrong with the form itself. In a vacuum, these are all fine abilities, but... well... I guess I'll just save the rest of that thought for later and just stick to the things I like about Jack 3. The game massively improves upon the completion aspect. Jack 2 had over 200 precursor orbs, but they didn't really contribute anything meaningful to the game. In Jack 3, there are 600 of the things, and while you still do use them for concept art, a level select, and behind the scenes material like Jack 2, they serve a much bigger role in the core gameplay loop as you find them all throughout the areas and can go to the secrets menu and spend them on things like new vehicles to drive in the desert with with their own stats and weapons, nifty enhancements like Dark Jack's attacks homing in on enemies, the jet board going really fast in the desert, and best of all, upgrades to the functionality of your weapons like ammo efficiency and rate of fire increases and so on. With rewards tied to your gameplay, I feel more incentive to spend more time looking for precursor orbs during the campaign, whether that be through the challenges that Jack 2 had, which you now spend Metalhead Skull Gems on, or just by doing jetboard exploration in the hub worlds that reward you with a surplus of orbs. Lastly, there's the soundtrack. I haven't really mentioned it up to this point, but I find the music in the Jack games to be pretty underrated. I highlighted the various moods that Josh Mansell pulled off in Jack 1, but this also carried over in Jack 2, even with its completely different direction. Jack 2 also had dynamic music where tracks would be altered if you were walking, fighting, shooting, driving, or jetboarding. That's not in Jack 3, but I figured I'd mention it since I forgot to do so in the Jack 2 video. The music in Jack 2 and 3 was done by Josh Mansell in the gameplay, but they also got a fellow named Larry Hopkins to score the cutscenes to add a more cinematic quality to the music, compared to games like Jack 1 where the cutscenes just keep playing level music in the background, and I'd say it was a successful effort. But as for Jack 3, the in-game music, I find, is memorable and atmospheric, so I often listen to it when doing other projects on my computer like thumbnails for videos and such. I've actually used Jack 3 music in several videos in the past because I find its vibe so easy to work into videos about other topics. I just used Subterranean, the theme of the forest and sewers in my Resident Evil 2 video from a few months back to use as an example. But there are plenty of examples of tracks I really like listening to from Jack 3. I mentioned earlier that the platforming action in the second act of Jack 3 was an improvement over the start of the game, and it is. And I'd like to use that as a thing I enjoy about Jack 3, but that's where we get back into the problems. In terms of raw platforming, Jack 3 has a lot of fun moments. The first visit to the Precursor Temple in the desert sees you climbing up the tower by jumping between crumbling platforms and swinging between poles. With Jack's entire moveset still being in Jack 3, it's still fun to roll jump off ledges and land and high jump, or uppercut off ledges and transition into a spin. Jack just feels great to play as, and that has remained true throughout the entire trilogy. I can speak to numerous levels that are fun to play in, like the sewers, the forest, the war factory, the mines, and all the levels with platforming as a central element are satisfying to play from the mechanics alone. However, what I enjoyed a lot about Jack was the seamless platforming and combat mix. But I can't say I fully enjoy the main levels and missions of Jack 3 because this game is one of the most broken combat systems I've ever experienced. Jack 2 had only four weapons, nothing compared to the roster you'd see from its sister series Ratchet and Clank, however less is more in this case. I thought Jack's four guns in Jack 2 were really well balanced around each other for reasons I stated in my video on that game. In Jack 3, the Scattergun, the Blaster, the Vulcan Fury, and the Peacemaker are all still in this game and work the same as they did in 2, so in theory the balance should still be intact. But things get screwed up the moment Jack 3 introduces additional modes upon the four weapons you have. Each of the four weapons will receive two new modes before the game is over, giving the game a total of 12 guns. I get it, they wanted to go big or go home, but if you're going to have all these weapons, you have to design enemies around that fact. 
You have to design the weapons to work in tandem, but they didn't. The first upgrade to the blaster alone breaks the game. You get the beam reflexor early on which causes the blaster shots to ricochet off of walls. This makes it so that in combat you barely have to try with this thing equipped, you just jump, spin, and shoot the beam reflexor and watch the sparks fly. In the arena you can see that I'm barely doing anything and yet the enemy total is drastically going down. This even dampens platforming levels. In the mines, you're supposed to shoot these targets to give the dynamite a path to reach the door while under a time limit, but with the beam reflexor, the shots may just travel so far all over the screen that it will hit all the targets after a few tries, ending the mission way before it was actually supposed to end. This strat gets people killed in Jack 2, but in Jack 3, it truly allows the combat to almost play itself. One weapon this OP is bad enough, but then you get the Gyro Burster, which, upon being fired, will send a mini UFO into the air that spreads blaster shots all over the screen with laser-like precision in hitting the enemies. When using the Gyro Burster and the Beam Reflexor together, no combat scenario stands a chance against you. Another utterly broken weapon is the Plasmite RPG, the third level for the Scattergun. This one tosses a grenade in front of you that decimates any enemy it comes into contact with, including the shields of the ultra-powerful Dark Makers you fight at the end of the game. You get the Plasmite RPG before the first level of the Peacemaker, but it makes the Peacemaker completely obsolete because it doesn't need to be charged up and tears through enemies just the same, with an almost identical amount of shots, but with much more frequent ammo drops because red ammo is never in short supply compared to dark ammo. The same issue applies to the blaster's upgraded weapons. Yellow ammo is so common that abusing the beam reflexor is very easy to do. But even if you run out of ammo for the scattergun or the blaster, it's no problem. Just grab the arc wielder which spews electricity all over the screen, or the needle laser which homes in on every enemy. Out of that too? Well, you still have the Peacemaker and its upgrades, the Mass Inverter which reverses gravity making every enemy in its range utterly helpless, or the Supernova which is just a screen nuke. And if that wasn't enough for you, you still have Dark Jack and Light Jack at your disposal. The perfect example of how Jack 3 is just not well balanced can be seen in the Stadium Ruins level. I ran in with the Plasmite RPG and the Gyro Burster and blew every enemy away before they knew what hit them. Then I tried it again with the Vulcan Fury weapons and did the same thing. Then I tried it with Light Jack, who, I remind, can make himself completely impervious to damage, while also having the power to heal and slow down time then turning into Dark Jack and unleashing his screen nuke powers. Jack 3 is just not a challenging game, that's because the player is showered in a sea of ultra-powerful killing machines. As I said, the enemies are not designed with this in mind because they don't feel like a threat. This can be satisfying, like the War Factory level where you just tear through all the enemies in this one-man raid, and then the part at the end where you find this vehicle to tear through the doors was a nice cherry on top of a good level. But I don't want to feel this powerful throughout the entire game. Even in the third act when the Dark Makers reach the Earth, the player can't be stopped. The Plasmite RPG will tear away their shields, Dark Jack will destroy them in no time, and so will all your other options. I get that they got a lot of heat for Jack 2 being as difficult as it was, but this is a comedic overreaction. I don't even mind that Jack 3 has way more checkpoints than Jack 2. In fact, if they left it at that, it would have been a quality improvement in the difficulty balancing since losing all your progress in a mission for the tiniest slip-up was too far. But really, it's just the stale combat that does Jack 3 in for me. You have so many weapons of mass destruction in your arsenal that combat is not fun to play anymore. I never die from a combat situation in Jack 3 because the enemies stand no chance against me. And even when it gets dicey, I can heal all my health with Light Jack. Even with all my experience, an enemy rush in Jack 2 still manages to be tense to me because you have to play your cards right to succeed in that game but not Jack 3. This is definitely one of the most unbalanced combat systems skewed in the player's favor I have ever seen. It just makes it difficult to enjoy what's worth enjoying in the game when its systems are not carefully considered. I enjoyed the second act the most because it was the part where the game focused on combat and platforming for several missions straight. Even if the combat isn't good in Jack 3, it's still one of the better parts of the game. But then, in the final hours of gameplay, the game just goes off the rails with the minigames. Like raiding the Metalhead Nest a second time with Sig in this giant tank. Followed by a mission where you shoot the cannon in that tank while Sig drives, aiming at Metalheads for no lie, five minutes straight. Of just holding down the shoot button. There's no overheating mechanic or anything, you just point and shoot at the targets that move very slowly where there are only like two or three things you need to shoot on screen at once. It goes on for an eternity. One of the main attractions for the endgame is the raid on the KG War Factory that hangs in the sky. And to get there, you need to grab something from the power station where Daxter must enter a computer and play this... Pac-Man type game. It's not full-on Pac-Man, but it's clearly evoking that imagery. And you know, 
some kind of homage to an older era of game could be interesting in a game that knows what it's trying to do, like say, the Quark 2D platforming levels of Ratchet & Clank 3, but when Jack 3 is forcing the players through this entourage of completely random game modes and mechanics that have nothing to do with Jack and Daxter, this just becomes part of the white noise. Defending Spargus from the Dark Makers isn't an all-out assault on the enemies. Of course not, it's a rail-shooting minigame that goes on for several minutes. Jack linking up with the Dark Maker ship for the first time sees you taking control of the mech suit from Jack 2 that I already didn't like as you, with no checkpoints, must reach the end of this hall. I spent almost 10 minutes on that because I died towards the end. After that, you have to raid Errol's ground base, and to do that, you must do another rail shooting minigame protecting Torn and his bombs that last for 6 minutes where you just point and hold down the shoot button. This really wears me down. It's just so boring, especially after all these other missions. And while I'm on this one, Sig just appears in this mission out of nowhere. Ashlyn tells Jack and Daxter they need to defend Torn and Jinx, and then in the mission, Sig is just there too with no explanation as he had nothing to do with the plot in Haven City before this point, and really doesn't after this mission either. All he does in this mission is hand you the supernova gun, which Jinx could have easily done. Or just not have Jinx and have Sig instead. Things like this are the only things catching my mind because otherwise the gameplay is just this for six minutes. Things don't just happen in the Jack and Daxter games for no reason. It's been a staple of the series since the first game. So yeah, that's another thing against Jack 3. Of course, I'm not saying you play all these minigames back to back, but we already went over the fact that Jack 3's combat greatly brings down the main gameplay, especially this late in the game where you have most of the weapons. So by the end, I'm just really bored with the game. And it doesn't help that the last nail in the coffin that cements Jack 3 as the worst game in the trilogy is the fact that the story is a mess. For starters, the plot is very unfocused. At the beginning of the video, I said you arrived in Spargus and you're getting to meet these new faces and then you're tossed back into Haven City to continue the conflict. So therefore, new characters like Cleaver just don't leave much of an impression. He doesn't get any screen time besides being the reason you have to go on pointless missions. He doesn't get the screen time to be anything else. But dividing up the screen time is a game-wide issue. By the end of Jack 2, the core cast of characters is pretty large, and now we add a few extra ones to the roster. Every character in Jack 2 played a role in the overall story and it came together in a satisfying way. In Jack 3, you can't just not have Kira, for example, be in the game without people wondering why she wasn't in the game. But because of that, you have the flip side problem of Kira just being there, doing and saying almost nothing from start to finish. Onan is another example of a character who served a purpose in Jack 2 who's just there in Jack 3. Hell, I'd even say Sig doesn't add anything to the story either. We learned that he was a spy in Jack 2 trying to find Damus' son but got caught up in working for Crew, but as a character, his role in the story is often confusing. Like I said, he just shows up in one of the last missions with no prior context whatsoever. So first, you have the fact that there are too many characters with not enough to do in the plot, just dropping in and out of the story as they please, but then we just don't get enough development for the actual important stuff. I like Damus, he's kind of a hard case at first, but warms up to Jack as the game goes on. I just think it's a little forced that they make sure to mention that Jack doesn't know his dad, something that never came up before this point, despite it being a clearly sore subject. And then later it's mentioned that Damus lost his son in Haven City. I'm thinking the bond between Jack and Damus would have been better if he was allowed more screen time, but that's the cost of the game going so quickly between Spargus and Haven City. One of the biggest issues I have with this plot is how there's no clear villain for the first three hours or so of the game. Count Vigor banishes Jack to the Wasteland, but this guy's no main villain. He doesn't have an army or powers or anything. So it doesn't feel like a threat, especially since he's getting mocked in so many cutscenes. You washed up, Vegan! Vigor! It's Vigor, you idiot! But then it's revealed that Errol is the main antagonist of Jack 3, and this always felt like such an ass pull. Errol was a rival to Jack in Jack 2, something I barely went into last time, but he died at the end of the game by driving himself into barrels of dark eco in an attempt to kill Jack. But now he got revived as a cyborg and as a super hammy Metal Gear boss who's controlling the metalheads and the KG robots and is communicating with the Dark Makers and is leading the charge in their attack on Earth? I say it as a question because I really have no idea what's going on in the plot half the time. It just confuses me more than anything else. Especially since Errol and Viger have nothing to do with each other. Viger was the one who attacked the palace at the beginning of the game to gain access to something in the catacombs to stop the Dark Makers himself, but Errol is the one instigating the war. It's not like Jack 2 where you're caught between two warring factions you have to fight against, it's just Vigor's a guy who needs to be stopped and Errol's up to something completely different. But luckily, Vigor's stopped pretty easily. In one of the weirdest scenes in the game, Ashlyn just dissolves the council that got Jack banished. Count Vigor, I hereby dissolve the city council and strip you of your title, command, and all privileges. Now get out of my sight. But at the beginning of the game, she said that couldn't be done. I guess she just hadn't thought of firing the council yet. 
The writing of this game just feels like it's being made up on the spot, when the previous game just felt so tightly written to build up to the grandest moments. To close this book, I think one of the worst elements of the plot is how inconsistent the tone is in Jack 3. I said last time that I found Jack 1 and 2 to both be funny games in terms of witty dialogue and physical humor, but Jack 3 made a much more concerted effort to have this ratchet and clank styled humor, and I think it's just not that funny. There are some good lines and moments in Jack 3, but largely it's all going in one ear and out the other when I replay this game. Then, serious moments don't get much time in the sun either. Like when Jack refuses to return to Haven City with Ashlyn, he then just does that the mission immediately after this. Okay, he got his mind changed with Ashlyn's last words to him, maybe, but it just feels rushed. No greater example of tonal whiplash in Jack 3 than the two most important cutscenes in the game. Damus comes to Jack's rescue when the duo is cornered by some Darkmaker machines, and we get the final mission with him after a whole game of building their relationship up. But after the task is accomplished, the car gets hit by a bomb that flips it over and mortally wounds Damus as he asks Jack to find his son. Mar, the youngest heir in the House of Mar, as Damus himself was once the leader of Haven City but was betrayed and banished by Praxis, leading to Jack 2's status quo. Jack immediately realizes that he is Damus' son, and getting separated from Damus is how Jack's younger self came to be in the care of the Underground in Jack 2. But before Jack can say anything, Damus dies and Count Viger, who just appears out of nowhere, reveals that he knew it all along and wanted to tap into Jack's special powers for himself before Jack got found by the Shadow and mocking that Damus never knew Jack was his son, getting Jack and Daxter fired up for a confrontation with Viger. But of course, we first have to play a minigame, and then we go from this dramatic death scene to the reveal that the precursors are actually Otzels, the species Daxter is. A scene played for laughs, which I really don't care about either way, it's not like finding out who the precursors were mattered to me in the previous games, but they chose to make this reveal as comedic as possible, with full-on fourth wall breaking gags, and again, ratchet styled humor about how they should have gone with a backup hero. It's just not that funny to me. It's nice that they tried to tie the whole trilogy together by explaining that since they made Eco, it contains their essence, which is why Daxter turned into one of them in Jack 1. But the real problem is that this comedic apex of the story is right next to the dramatic apex of the plot. The writing in this game is just all over the place, setting up for a climax that just doesn't land the way it's supposed to. I, for starters, don't care about the Dark Makers. They're former precursors who got corrupted by Dark Eco and now destroy planets. Will Earth be next? No way, Jack's arsenal is far too loaded for that to happen, they can't touch me, so I'm not afraid of them. And then, Errol is the final boss, this character who still, even by the finale, just feels like such a tacked-on afterthought that you're still wondering why they even decided to bring him back, of all characters, to be the climactic final enemy of the Jack trilogy. It doesn't help that the first part of the final boss is really annoying as you need to shoot these targets on this terraformer's legs, but whenever you get down to the last one, it always takes forever to shoot it. Then the second phase is laughably broken in your favor, like all the other combat scenarios in the game. But hey, at least this shot of Jack and Daxter walking through the sand is pretty cool. And I almost forgot about that. This game rewrote the fact that Kira was Jack's love interest in favor of Ashlyn, who was presumed to be Torn's before. So yeah, that was a weird thing they did in Jack 3 that came out of nowhere and goes nowhere as well. But then we get the ending where Daxter finally gets that pair of pants he's been waiting for, and the precursors invite Jack on a tour of the universe, where it's then implied that Jack was the real Mar, his own ancestor, and created Haven City and all that, and then went back in time to this very moment, but I choose not to think that's the case, because making Jack the real Mar just makes him a little too important for my liking. But that's just me. Wait, Jack is Mar? The Mar? I just assume that he changed his mind and pulled a Batman exit and appears here, just in time for the ending shot. I couldn't leave you, Dax. With all our adventures ahead, you wouldn't last a second without me. Ah, what a team we are! Yeah, well, the next adventure, I call the shots. Put it in, partner. Ha! Psych! Oh, yeah. Life is good. Jack 3 is an interesting game to me. After all the complaining I just did, I might as well rip the band-aid off and say I don't hate Jack 3. It's like I said at the beginning, it's not some unplayable mess. Not that this is where the bar should be, I'm just saying. 
It didn't kill the series or some melodramatic line like that. It's a finished, polished product with all the same elements I enjoy from the previous games. I just think Jack 3, in so many ways, did not live up to its potential. The game just doesn't feel inspired to me. It obviously had its inspirations like Mad Max or this Rockstar game called Smuggler's Run on PS2. However, my point is that Jack 1 and 2 had a history to them that I thought was worth exploring. The things that inspired those games, the culture of the video game industry that affected those two titles. To me, Jack 3 just feels like Jack 2, but with more stuff in it, made with the intent to address the issues people had with that game. It's not a terrible goal, I understand, it's just that in execution it makes Jack 3 feel kinda bland, being pulled in too many different directions. It wants to be the epic finale of the Jack trilogy, and it also wants to be this funny game, and also wants to have all these crazy weapons and powers, but with the game not doing the work to make the enemies scale with your weapons, it makes the combat a breeze, and with writing this all over the place, it fails at almost everything it sets out to do. Tossed in a bunch of minigames, and that's Jack 3. I don't think it sucks, I just think it really isn't that great either. I can play this any old day of the week if I felt so inclined. It's just one of those games where I can play it, it's just that I'd prefer not to. Like I'm Bartleby the fucking Scrivener over here. It's a C-tier game to me, which as I defined in a previous video, is a game that is okay at the end of the day, just not one you'd be clamoring to revisit. A lot of folks in the audience really love Jack 3, and that's fine, I get it. It's just that I think the game could have been a lot better if different choices were made in regards to its focus and difficulty design. I mentioned at the beginning that there wasn't much to tell about the history and context of Jack 3, but I merely meant that as not much that would matter for my opinion on the game at the start of the video. What I did find interesting in the research phase of this video was Naughty Dog reflecting on their history in an interview with IGN from 2019. There, they confirmed what the design bible already said that Jack 3 was setting out to address the criticisms Jack 2 had received. But I also learned something I didn't know. What I did know was that following Jack 3, Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin, the co-founders of Naughty Dog, had left the company. Jason Rubin felt burnt out and tied down by being the head of this company and wanted to explore other avenues in the industry, which he's still doing to this day. Jack X Combat Racing was the first title Naughty Dog did entirely without the founders, but the surprising part was that they already knew they weren't going to be around much longer when Jack 2 was coming out. So, the development of Jack 3 was also about facilitating a smooth transition from the original leadership to the Evan Wells & Co. leadership that we know today that properly began with Jack X leading into the Uncharted era. This is pure speculation on my end. Again, pure speculation. I'm thinking that if the main thing Naughty Dog was trying to achieve in 2004 was smoothly changing leadership, then maybe that explains why Jack 3 is the way it is. Just add more stuff to the game. That, to me, explains why the combat is so unbalanced and filled to the brim with minigames. The game was made in a year, was most likely rushed, and while they said the leadership change was smooth and effective, I do wonder if the actual game being made at the time fell by the wayside. I guess there's no way for me to know, but that theory does kind of explain it for me. But again, it's not that the game is bad, I just think it's kind of a mess. Having said all that, that covers the Jack trilogy, something that, as a whole, I will always have fondness for, even if I don't think Jack 3 sticks the landing. But luckily, this wasn't the last Jack game on PS2, or even the last Jack game done by Naughty Dog, because next week we're covering the legendary Jack X Combat Racing. So until then, I'll say what I always do. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.